Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have uh, the privilege to have with us Jonathan Pajot. Jonathan is an artist. He's uh, an icon carver, but he's also a very talented speaker. I'd say philosopher and theologian and commentator on many uh, current issues. He has his own podcast and he has uh, his own YouTube channel. It's called The Symbolic World and uh, many, many uh, interesting interviews on there and many, uh, many nice topics to, uh, to think about. So, hello Jonathan, how do you do? I'm doing well. It's nice to meet you and to be here with you. Great, thank you. So, uh, let's start, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where are you from? Where did you study? Have you always been an artist? Is uh, I know that you carve icons on wood. Was this your first medium? Let's uh, tell us a bit about how you came to this. Well, I, uh, I'm French Canadian. You know, French is my first language. My parents, my father, when I was young, was a Baptist minister, converted from uh, Catholicism. Like so many French speaking people in Quebec, you know, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, there was a mass exodus from the Catholic Church. And then a group of them became Protestant, which, were, which was the story of my family. And so I grew up in a very kind of authentic Christian home. My parents were very, uh, were very authentic in their faith and very serious about what they believed. So I grew up in that, that milieu. But in my 20s, I guess, when I started to study art and uh, just, just my thought, you know, when in your late teens and early 20s, you know, you start to think and you start to search and you start to ask questions. I really experienced something of a spiritual crisis, I guess you could call it. Um, partly related to art, which was being a Baptist making visual arts. How does that work theologically? How could I justify it? How could I integrate it into my faith? But then also a Christian making contemporary art, which is very cynical and very, uh, you know, contemporary art is extremely detached and uh, ironic. And so I really struggled on that. And at the same time, it was manifesting itself as a struggle, worldview struggle, you could say. Um, and so in that struggle, I started reading, I read, you know, authors from other traditions, reading from other religions, you know, I read uh, perennialist authors, uh, and it kind of broke at least my modernistic thinking. And uh, during that search is when I discovered the Church Fathers, especially St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Maximus, the Confessor, you know, Dionysus, the Areopagite's works, um, all of that just basically reconverted me to Christianity, you could say. I discovered the depth, the cosmic mystery, the cosmic vision of the, um, of the, the possibilities of seeing Christianity as a, as a cosmic vision, let's say, as a worldview, instead of being a modernist and then having this story of Jesus kind of stapled on top of it. Right. Uh, and so all through that, you know, and, and it was also discovering the medieval art and just how much it was a complement to this cosmic vision how medieval art was like a sacred algebra, a sacred language uh, in which you could exist, in which you could live, and a lens through which you could actually see the world. And, uh, and so all of that, while I was discovering that, I was a little sad because it felt as if it used to exist, but now it doesn't exist, until I discovered, of course, the Orthodox Church, where the medieval traditions, the kind of universal Christian medieval traditions were not only preserved, but were uh, you know, added on and kind of celebrated. Um, and the same with the vision, the, this kind of Christian vi cosmic vision that we see in St. Gregory of Nyssa and the early fathers was also still there, not only there, but was just an in integral part of the, of the church, discovering hesychasm and, and the mystical practice, which ultimately led me to convert to orthodoxy. Were you in art school at the time? Did you go to art school or? <clears throat> I'd finished art school. I studied uh, painting at Concordia mm -hmm. uh, and I did well in school, but I was confronted the whole time so much that I remember at the end of my time in school, the, the professor that was in charge of me, she said, you know, Jonathan, in my final evaluation, she said, Jonathan, don't worry, you're getting all A's, uh, you know, you're doing fine, but really, you don't belong here, <laughs> which really? is just hilarious. And she said, you should go to the seminary or something. Uh, and I, I, at the time, it just rolled off my back because I was a cocky, you know, 20 something year old. But uh, looking back now, she was right. And discovering iconography and the traditional arts of the church was really, for me, a, uh, a way to integrate everything together. You know, my faith, my art practice, uh, my, my vision of the world. And so, I've, you know, since then, I haven't turned back or looked back on, on, on the other world, let's say. 
Did you start by um, painting icons or you went into wood carving uh, immediately or? Well, it's a happen? funny story. When I became a catechumen, at, I started going into Orthodox Church in 2001. And uh, of course, I desperately wanted to paint icons. Here I was. I had given up on contemporary art. I destroyed all my artwork, shut down my studio, done all that. So I desperately wanted to paint icons. But at the time, it was very difficult to find a teacher. And I, I noticed and I, I realized very quickly that it was very almost impossible to learn iconography on your own. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult because of the egg egg painting and just the, the very technical, strong technical aspect of it. And so I felt like I was just looking around trying to figure out what to do. And then one day my parents cut down a tree in their yard. It was a linden tree. And they said, hey, Jonathan, we hear this tree is good for carving. Would you like to have some pieces and you know, play with it? And I, right away I thought, okay, I'm gonna make a blessing cross. Like that was the first thing I thought. But I had no tools. I had nothing. I basically had exacto knives. And so I carved the entire cross, which is insane. The actual shape of the cross and the, the figure on it with exacto knives. Um, and, uh, and so I, that's how it started. And I showed it to the priest at the parish. It was Father John at the, OC, at the, uh, the sign. And he looked at it kind of, you know, a little bit on the, because it wasn't great, but it was okay. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, this, this, you know, you should, you should keep doing this. You should try, try again. And that's how it started. I made another one. This time I, I bought, I got tools and I took the time to, to make it. And then Father John really said, you know, you really need to keep doing this. Uh, and so that's how it started. Then there was a long detour in my life where I did other things, but ultimately I ended up coming back to, uh, to, uh, to carving. So I carve wood, but I also carve stone icons. So uh, steatite and, uh, and wood. You carve, you carve stone. Really? There's, there's an old tradition, a Byzantine tradition of carving soapstone. Uh, they had this kind of green steatite that they carved. Uh, and I lived, in, I lived in Africa in this kind of intermediary period, you could call it. I lived in Africa for seven years, working with artisans there. And uh, I lived in Kenya, in this region of Kenya called Kisi, where they carve this beautiful light colored soapstone. It's very dense. And so it can hold detail very well. Uh, and I fell in love with the stone. I just really did. And I, I asked the carvers there to teach me to carve it. And immediately I started carving icons with the, the stone. And I would say right now, it's, it's about 80 to 90% of what I carve is this soapstone because it, it's kind of like, it, it's like my ivory because ivory is very, it's not really possible to carve it anymore. Um, and so this stone is a way to recapture some of that aesthetic and some of that sensibility, but in, uh, but with the, with the soapstone. Yeah, really interesting. And uh, when you carve on the soapstone, uh, the uh, soapstone, so it stays the natural color of the stone. There's no, or do you put color on it? No, I, for now, at least I just leave it the natural color, but I also gild it. And I also have different types, different colored stones. And so some of my carvings will actually be uh, kind of a puzzle, you know, we, we, certain parts of the carving will be made with certain types of colored stone and then other parts with other colors. And so, um, let's say I made an icon of St. Michael killing the dragon where his whole vestment was made with a, uh, with a kind of pinkish stone, but his wings were white. And so kind of playing with these different stones, um, and also in integrating mosaic into the carvings. So, um, so having different other even other types of stones like lapis lazuli or uh you know different types of semi-precious stones onyx and different stones integrated mm -hmm. into the carvings oh okay so you and these stones you have to are they like readily available or you have to where do you get lapis lazuli or stones like this where do you find them these days well you can buy anything uh but the lapis is very fascinating because lapis is extremely expensive and hard mm -hmm. to get and one day while well, after i started carving professionally some man a canadian military guy wrote me and said he was living in afghanistan mm -hmm. and he said i love what you're doing i think it's, it's it's really powerful and i really would like to do something for you and so he said give me your address i want to send you something and so several months later i got a beat up box you know completely beat up with like another beat up box inside because it had been opened i don't know how many times and then in it was just a huge chunk of lapis, which must be worth right. like thousands of dollars. Uh, and so that's how I access my lapis. And so we're being, we're very careful about how we treat it and cut it and, and use it as, as, as well as we can. Right, to use it sparingly, yeah.
And when you're working on an icon, so what is the process? Do you, uh, like I know in, in by tradition, the iconographers would, uh, they would fast or have prayers or they would sort of withdraw from activity. What is your, how, how do you prepare yourself or how do you go about this? Yeah, it's very different for someone who does it professionally. Uh, and so this tradition of, of fasting before making icons, it's actually a pretty recent one. And it's also a monastic tradition. For someone who has married and has children and kind of has to carve icons all the time, you can't fast before you make an icon because you would just be fasting nonstop. Like you would just fast all the time. Right. And so for me, at least, I just see it more as kind of integrated into my daily uh kind of a normal daily orthodox practice of daily prayers and, and, you know, going to confession, going to the liturgy. And so I don't prepare in a specific way in terms of prayer and fasting. Uh, but of course I do prepare in terms of, let's say, you know, making, knowing the iconology that, uh, that I'm in, engaged with, you know, kind of encountering the saint that I'm going to make an icon with of, you know, usually I will have a, uh, certain encounters with the saint, you could say in terms of prayer and in terms of uh, researching them, trying to, to kind of learn their story. And so that's more the type of preparation that I'll do mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm making something which is, um, which is in line with the tradition and is not, is not uh, an idiosyncrasy on my part. Mm -hmm. So this is now your full-time activity. That's wonderful. If you can, uh, you know, like uh, make your living from this and, and do, uh, follow your charisma and do this kind of work. So that's really great. So let's turn now to your, um, to the symbolic world, this, uh, uh, YouTube channel you have and the podcasts, what is the symbolic world? What do you mean? What do you understand by symbolic and the symbolic world? Um, and so this was really, you could say part of the discovery that I had in discovering the church and discovering the church fathers, uh, was a, a, a discovery of a worldview, you could say. Um, and this is something that happened with my brother at the time. My brother is not Orthodox, though. He kind of studied more on the, on the Judaic side, reading rabbinical commentary, and kind of discovering also the way that they saw Scripture as a, also as a worldview, like seeing the world through Scripture, uh, rather than, you know, being modern minds inter interpreting scripture. And so you could say that that's really what the symbolic world is. The, the, symbol the idea of the symbolic world is that the world is ultimately a theophany, that the, the, world the world manifests, you know, God, but that also happens in terms of meaning. That is, the world is manifesting itself through meaning, and you can see it, and you can kind of notice that, and then you can realize that it actually follows patterns. And the pattern is just really the pattern of scripture. It's, a, it's the pattern of, of, the, of the first chapters in Genesis. So a way to understand is that the first chapters of Genesis are almost like a map of reality. Not just a description of what happened at the beginning, but a description of the, the way the world is holding together ontologically. And then after that, you realize that all of scripture is just an unfolding of that pattern in, in, in different versions and different uh, ways culminating, of course, into Christ, who is, ends up being kind of the summit of this pattern and also solving a lot of the questions and puzzles which are set up in the first chapters of Genesis. And now, so once you realize that, it's not just an abstract thing. It's not just something fun that you see in scripture, but it actually ends up being a lens through which you can view the world and you can interpret anything, right? You can look at anything and see it through that lens. You can look at, you can watch movies, you can look at political events, you can look at something as simple as a handshake and understand how it is a manifestation of these patterns. It's something that is there. I mean, it's there in St. Maximus, of course. St. Maximus doesn't have to make it explicit because he lives in a traditional world where this is just part of life. And so this kind of liturgical world, the liturgical life in which they lived uh, was so implicit that they didn't have to explain it. You, know, you, you just give hints of it, and then people kind of live in this poetry that the world manifests itself in. Uh, in our case, we have a problem, which is that because of secularization, because of, uh, you know, let's say, the modern mind and this kind of abstraction which comes with uh, Descartes and all of this way of thinking, we now are kind of lost in the world, we could say. And so we have to retrace the world back to help people re-experience the world as this theophany and as this, this world full of meaning.
And so that is really what the symbolic world is. And so what I'll do is I will, first of all, try to make explicit this basic pattern that we find in Genesis, how this pattern from the garden, you know, to the flood is also the pattern of a church, its architecture, it's the pattern of the temple in the Old Testament, uh, it's the pattern of a story, it's the pattern of your experience, your experience of attention from your focus to the margins in which things start to break apart. Uh, and so just trying to help people understand that that's the, that's the pattern and then give examples as, so that people can re-enter into that, that world, let's say. But today you mentioned yourself, secularization, in the in today where we're basically kind of uh, entering a post-christian society or we are in a post-christian society and uh, people especially young people uh, have very little notion of uh, what's written in the bible or the gospels uh, do you think this is going to survive this sort of uh, pattern or this knowledge uh, yeah not only is yeah. it going to survive but it's the it's it's the necessary future there there this is Read the re-enchantment of the world is happening. It's happening before our very eyes. And yeah, either Christians wake up to it or they become a victim of it because I'll give you a simple example. So one of the people I'm working with is a, is a professor at the University of Toronto. His name is John Verveke. And he's involved in 4D uh, cognitive science. And in the world of cognitive science, you know, there's a realization that the patterns of meaning are inevitable for you to experience the world. And this is bleeding out, not only in cognitive science, but it's bleeding out in theories of complexity, the, the, you know, the, everybody's obsession with notions like emergence, you know, uh, systems theories, all of these, all of these new fields or these fields that are kind of hot uh, on, the, on, on the horizon are all dealing with the question of patterning and the question of how potential and patterns meet. Um, and St. Maximus is the solution, offers the perfect solution. St. Dionysus, the, the idea of incarnational thinking is, this, is the solution to a lot of the problems that the fields are dealing with right now. And so I think that Christians need to really kind of step up and speak into this as much as possible because, they, because we have a way to help people kind of re-enter into this world of... Uh, this world of patterning, a way that is healthy and, and uh, balanced. If we don't, what we're gonna see is we're gonna start to see, and it's already happening, we're gonna start to see religious phenomena break into reality in ways that are destructive and dangerous. We're gonna see scapegoating, we're going to see tribalism, we're going to see uh, you know, these, these kind of random sacred uh, objects appearing and disappearing. You know, the virality of, uh, let's say virality on the internet is an example of religion gone astray. It's an example of these little idols that appear and disappear and just kind of gather all attention and worship, you would say, and then vanish. And then it just, it's a cycle, it's a cycle of attention. Um, and so as people start to realize, for example, something like that, that the world is made of attention and that we need to be, we need to know, know how attention works and how it holds the world together. I think that this is this is what Christians really need to now kind of wake up and speak into. Uh, so I, I not only do I think that it's that it's going to stay, I think that it's coming back fast and it's inevitable. You know, whether it has a Christian form or not is the big is the big question, but it's it's coming back. I guess that's the importance of uh, evangelization, as we often hear. You know, to uh, sp spread this message or you know, pass this message on or help people to understand this, this worldview. But I think about like um, uh, Asia, for example, where um, the Christian message is not really known. And you think of an, of an enormous country like China, for example, like how, how do we deal with all of this? How are we going to... Uh, you mean how are we going to to what to spread the message of Christianity? Yes, well, it's ba basically, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's we need saints, is what we need. Like that's really the way. Like it's an the Orthodox manner is is an embodied way. That is, we need we need holy people to mm -hmm. not just explain the message or not just give the message, but you know, just be a shining 
example of the of the message you could say uh but like in our case i would say we have enough to worry about with our post-secular world and our you know it's like i'm not thinking about china like i'm thinking about my nihilistic suburb uh you know flat existence here in quebec and i'm trying to help people <laughs> swim their way out of that uh yeah. and and uh, we'll let and at least in my case that's like we'll let others uh think of Think of China and, uh, and, uh, and other places like that. That makes sense. Yeah, you have to start at home. Start at home. And talking about uh, China and Asia, uh, there's a lot of interest. I think it's, on, it's waning now, but for the last 30 years, there was so much interest in Asian religions, Asian cultures, and Buddhism. I mean, you can go into a hardware store and you'll see a Buddha there. I mean, you yeah. see, there were Buddhas everywhere for a while. There used to be <laughs> no more Christian... Uh, statues, no statues of the Virgin Mary, but everywhere you went to a cafe, a hardware store and parks, there's all, there's like a, the Buddha everywhere. Yeah. So do you think so what is, is going on? on? Exactly. Well, it's easy to understand, but it's so it's both a it's both a it's both a danger and not an opportunity. This is the way I think Christians can understand it. On the one hand, it's a sign of, of a social breakdown. Mm -hmm. You know, when people become fascinated with the strange and are incapable of seeing the value of their own story, it means that you're on the edge of the world, right? You're on the edge of your story. You're near the end because, you know, you, you become hyper fascinated with the, the fascination of these, of the, these strange beings that are kind of presenting themselves to you. I think that's one of the things that happened in, in this fascination with Buddhism. People become obsessed and, and see value in anything, any religion except their own, like except their anything own. except our thing is is worthy of attention and is deep and is meaningful but our thing is stupid and superstitious mm -hmm. um but it's also an opportunity for christians because one of the reasons why people are interested in buddhism is because they come from a very materialist superficial and uh you know mechanistic way of seeing the world and their Christ the christianity that they came out of was also that, you know, there's still this, the ghost of 19th century historical criticism and all that nonsense that just destroyed religion and spent all its time trying to either defend Christianity by finding stupid statuettes in Palestine and trying to think that this is how we're going to prove that this existed or this didn't exist. And, you know, all these breaking down of the Bible into different sources and, and all this historical criticism made religion into just nothing. Uh, and on top of that, the kind of sentimentalist, moralist vision, which tried to compensate for that, made Christianity into nearly nothing. And so the reason why people are interested in Buddhism or, or in, in Hinduism especially is because they see this integrated cosmic vision. They see something which holds the world together and also is, is supposed to be transformative. Not just about going to heaven or hell or about being a good little boy or, you know, it's, a, it's really about a transformation of the person. Now, the reality is that all of that, we have it. It's all there in our tradition. It's all there in orthodoxy. We have it in the fathers, uh, you know, like the, the, the more cosmic fathers, like I mentioned at the outset. And we also have it in the hesychastic tradition through the idea of the transformation of the person into theosis. And so... It's actually an opportunity to surprise people and to, 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 it's almost like there are these, a lot of fantasy kind of science fiction stories revolve around the idea of an ancient civilization, which is lost, you know, this, this ancient past with nobody remembers, but there are these fragments of it. And now we rediscover it and it, and it becomes like a treasure that we find. Well, that's the opportunity we have now because that is Christianity for our world. There are treasures there are treasures that can be counted. We have, you know, the text of Saint, of Saint Ephraim the Syrian are beyond description in their beauty and their capacity to capture a cosmic vision of, of, of Christianity. And so we need as Christians to rediscover those, to live in them, and then, and then people will be attracted to it because the power is there. It's just we've lost it in the last few centuries. It's... Uh... It's talking about the fathers of the church, uh, I uh, it was the time when I read a lot in, uh, on the fathers and uh, I worked on St. John Chrysostom and I thought, 
well, this is pretty much finished. But then I uh, started watching your podcast and I started hearing, you know, you're talking about the fathers. And I figured, hey, wow, this is like a young person has uh, knows about the fathers of the church and has this. Uh, and uh, I even saw like certain discussions of the fathers of the church, which I saw sort of like um, discussed in a modern and I, want, I don't want to say secular, but I saw the way the fathers were coming back uh, in, uh, in sort of a philosophical way. And I thought, oh my goodness, what an opportunity. The fathers are becoming uh, popular again. And so uh, the fathers too, I guess, could be, do you, th you, you basically, do you think that they are readable for a larger public today? Like, Well, I think they need, they need some, I, need, I think at the outset, they need some translation because, you know, obviously they were, despite what modern people think, they were speaking in a time where people were more uh, educated, and especially the elites, and more had a better understanding of philosophy and just different levels of understanding. Whereas today, th there's a lot of groundwork to be done because we flatten understanding. So we have this idea that knowledge is basically only technical. You know, we, we, people don't have a sense of this hierarchy of, of knowledge and this hierarchy of wisdom, which kind of lays itself up on top of just basic scientific technical knowledge. So there's a work to be done at the outset to help people understand what it is that the fathers are talking about. Uh, but I think that once that happens and people can dive into, dive into it and see it, especially the poetic works, you know, I mean, reading St. Gregory Palamas is obviously inaccessible to most of us anyways like even us orthodox read mm -hmm. saint gregory and you're like okay i don't even know what he's talking about but but in terms of people like uh you know like stand up from the syrians hymns on paradise for example or saint gregory of nice's life of moses these texts are extremely easily available because they're narrative because they're an analogical they use poetic forms and so i think that i think that they are it, it just we just need to be able to do the groundwork um, and the, the first groundwork is for us as Orthodox and as Christians to, to plunge back into these texts as well and see them as, as life-giving rather than just something you need to know, you know, to be on the right side of the Orthodox line, let's say. Uh, what, what, uh, one thing that I experienced uh, in the early 90, 1990s, this is about 30 years ago, just after the breakdown of uh, communism there and the, the, break, uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, I was in Russia for uh, a half a year in 1994 and uh, I started seeing like, you know, in the, me in the metro stations you have kiosks where there's uh, books, you know, pocket books on sale. I started seeing like the fathers of the church all over the place <laughs> in the metro stations. And uh, in, uh, so people had, you know, just moved from official atheism and they were kind of searching for new meaning and these books were were everywhere and I thought holy cow I'll never see that in uh, in my society like in the Western world or in Canada uh, and I guess they just started putting those books out and then there's the you probably know that um, the edition Source Chrétienne they publish the fathers in French critical editions well most of their uh, most of their editions probably don't go anywhere beyond like a thousand or two thousand copies. But at one point, Sir Skretien, um, the Russians started translating their editions into Russian. And um, they were like printing out a hundred thousand copies or two hundred thousand copies. So it was like a huge number. And, um, and I guess people were like picking these things up and starting to read them. And I thought, well, maybe that's the way too, is to to uh, prepare inexpensive editions and make them available, put them on, put them in uh, in popular book kiosks or in universities or something like this, and maybe people will start reading them. I don't know. Yeah, because the source gets in material for for how I mean, we're all happy it exists, but it's completely unavailable to most people. First of all, the books are super expensive, well, way too expensive. Yeah, yeah, and then also they are they are critical editions, which no one, nobody outside of academia cares about. Like, I don't if I'm if I'm trying to improve my spiritual life, I could care less about a critical edition, right? It's a mm -hmm. it's it, they're useful for the scholars, but they're not useful for most people. So I think that the technique that St. Vladimir has been taking on now, right, in the recent years with mm -hmm. their little patristic series, 
is wonderful. Little books, you know, that have been edited for you that don't necessarily, that, that will kind of condense things. They have this little book uh, of St. Maximus. It's called, uh, what's it called? Oh, I can't believe I forget it. it. It's like something like the the Cosmic Christ or something like that. Mm -hmm. People will, will berate me for not remembering the title of it. Uh, it's wonderful, right? And so because they go into the ambigua and they take, they kind of choose the ambigua that are most, most condensed and most talking about the manner in which Christ, you know, uh, how the world is in Christ and Christ is in the world and this kind of vision that St. Maximus has, you know, and you look at the book, it's not threatening. It's, you know, it's less than 200 pages uh, and it's well put together by theme. And I think that if we do that, then then these books will be way more accessible and people will will love them. I've been pushing the um, the hymns on paradise, you know, for a few years now. And, and I'm pretty sure that they must have sold thousands of copies of that because it's it's such a, you know, and it's a the, the St. Vladimir's version has a nice introduction by Sebastian Brock, which is which is very helpful. And mm -hmm. then the hymns are just presented simply. And so I, I think that that's what we need. Definitely. Uh, coming back now again to this question of uh, symbolism. So in the symbolic world, you see everything is being sort of a symbol. Everything is symbolic of something else. Could you say it's everything is symbolic of some kind of underlying reality, which we do not see or do not have access to? Or Yeah, it's really in the vision of St. Maximus's Logi. That is a way to, to understand it in a modern way, let's say in a, in a very cognitive science way is to understand that the world is 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 too complex like the world has infinite details everything that you look at everything you encounter has an infinite amount of complexity to it right whether it be the cup that i'm drinking of you know or the 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 drop of water going down the my you know the the pane of my window that has indefinite complexity but despite that indefinite complexity we are able to perceive unity and so you know, a chair is not one thing, right? A chair is a million things. A chair is, a, is an indefinite amount of things. First of all, it has parts. And then those parts are also have parts. And then those parts also have parts. So how is it that we're able to view unity in multiplicity? And what we realize, and this is what CogSci is realizing it, it, realizing as well, is that our perception of unity is, teleolo is, is teleological. It is purpose-driven. It is meaning-driven. And so that really coincides with the, the notion of uh, what St. Maximus talks about in terms of the Logi. Of course, the purpose or the ultimate cosmic reason for the thing I am encountering is hidden to me, right? It's, it's hidden behind the thing, uh, but it is nonetheless holding it together and pulling me towards it. You could say the good of the chair is what is pulling me to even see a chair, right? Even in, in a very simple way that is, if I'm looking at a chair, the first thing I'm asking myself is, is it a good chair? If I sit on it, will it break, right? I, it's, a, it's an embodied re encounter with a being. And so that is the manner in which symbolism is inevitable. That is that things necessarily have to unite unity and multiplicity. And they have to do it through a hierarchy. And they have to do it through a pattern. And that hierarchy, even for a chair, is the same hierarchy that you find in the temple. It is a movement from multiplicity into one and an invisible place in behind, hidden inside that object where ultimately the grace of God meets creation and becomes a, a little theophany. And ultimately, like as St. Maximus says, it's all Christ ultimately that is hidden behind all of these layers. It's Christ himself. It's the divine logos himself that is hidden behind all these layers and which is holding reality together. Um, I can sort of follow you uh, if we're... The question is this, a question that has often interested me is, is ultimate reality number or is ultimate reality discourse, meaning the word? Um, when you go back to Pythagoras and the, you know, the stuff we learned in high school and the Pythagorean theorem and, and uh, well, back to the ancient Greeks, some thought that ultimate reality is number and then others, if you go to philosophers like Heraclitus, uh, they were more on the side of discourse. Heraclitus says everything is always changing, things disappear, new things come, and so on. And um, in contradic in, uh, from contradictions, we have new truths, and so on, which is, uh, do doesn't really hold water in a Thomistic uh, sense. But 
But so you have these two visions, number and discourse. So would you be saying that ultimate reality then is a kind of discourse when you say the Logoi, when you say we can either understand, how do you understand the Logos? Do you understand the Logos as word or do you understand the Logos as reason? Because for, for the Greeks, Logos also meant like study or reason, like we have anthropology, psychology, we have this word Logos, which kind of means a study. So how do you see the Logos? Yeah, I, I don't see it as a study. I, I see it as reason in the other way we understand the word reason, which is purpose. That is the, the reason why something exists. That is its logos. Now it's hidden to, to us. We can glimpse it. We can kind of get a sense of it. But that is what I mean. That is mostly what I mean in terms of, of reason that it, or logos. That it's the, it's the reason for, which it, for, for why that thing exists. Um, but then it also that reason will un unfold in reason in the sense of discourse. Like it will unfold in the explanation or the 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 description or the 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 truth of the thing. Uh, you know, in, in the sense of describing what it is and describing what it does, and all of this will kind of flow from its reason. But the reason is is the ultimate is the thing holding reality together. The reason for for its its existence. So I mean, that happens be... through man. Like, it's not a, it's not something, I think this is one of the great mysteries that St. Maximus offers us compared to a kind of more Thomistic vision, is that this happens through humans. We don't have to abstract ourselves from humanity. Human beings are the laboratory of extremes. Human beings are the microcosm through which meaning comes, you know, from the infinite and then manifests itself into the world. So that solves a lot of problems for us. Because the problem that we have, like with Aristotelian thought, and a lot of people say, is that you know the the reasons for things they they don't exist outside of man, right? It's like the reason for a rock is a stupid reason question to ask, but it's not stupid if we understand that meaning use comes through humans. Human beings are the 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 crux of cognition and the crux of meaning, and so then the meaning of the rock is the meaning that humans use it for. Right, the meaning of a rock is to be an altar. Right, the meaning of a rock is to be uh, a house, and so it it completely it doesn't. Uh, how can I say this? It changes the way we perceive the, the way that we perceive ontology if we perceive it as human beings as being the microcosm of the of the cosmos. So when you're talking about meaning, meaning, if I understand you properly, also means sort of purpose. It's like yeah. it's the we're, everything is going towards a certain purpose, and we're going towards like. An eschaton, like you said at the beginning, a, 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 a manifestation of the end or a revelation at, at the end. Definitely, that's that's exactly it. But they 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 let's say they go together, right? So, like I said, it's it, that one is the one is kind of the cause of, of the other. That is the 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 meaning, you know, then ends up that let's say directing all the other aspects of the of the object. And so the, the physical description or the, the analytical description of something, it, those things are all real. They all have reality, but they're always subject to the reason why I'm perceiving this in the first place, right? The reason why I'm able to perceive unity in indefinite multiplicity. So you can see it as really right from Genesis, right? It's like there's a, there's a word, a, a reason, which comes down from heaven and encounters the waters of chaos and that what that does is it pulls out of the water firm ground. It pulls a mountain out of the water. And that mountain is any phenomena that we're able to perceive in the world. Anything we're able to perceive as having unity will be a little microcosm of that first moment where a reason came down and encountered potential and, and manifested a being. So you'd be able to apply this to uh, the natural world, the natural sciences, for example. How do they fit into this uh, symbolic view or this view of uh, meaning? That when a scientist studies nature, he's not really asking uh, the question of meaning. He's trying to describe what is. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a lie. He's not trying to describe what is because let me let me. Let me re reformulate it maybe for you. And so the boundaries of things are, are bound up in, 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 in a hierarchy of meaning. Okay. 
So let's look at, let's say, let's, see, let's even think of something like natural sciences, right? And so there'll be a hierarchy in the natural sciences of what we study, and there'll actually be resources put into different aspects of the natural sciences. And that hierarchy will be completely coherent and consistent. Let's say a scientist uh, says that he wants to do a paper on taking a bucket of sand and analyzing the size and the width of every single grain of sand, spending his whole life doing that, and then showing the, 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 the chemical distinction between each grain and creating a, a giant graph, which would take up you know, a thousand computers to be, able to, cal to be able to show the difference between every single grain of sand. And, and, and so it's like, no one would fund that. No one would care. Because ultimately, we, we, we always pay attention to things in a hierarchy of importance based on human meaning. Sometimes it gets lost to us because we think that we're just describing what is. But we're always describing what is in relationship to us, right? in relationship to what it can say about us uh, and what it can bring us. That's why there is a very, people try to make a hard distinction between science and technology, but that hard distinction always falls apart because people are always asking, well, if you're studying that bug, that's great, but are you going to be able to find some medicine from it? Are you going to be able to help us understand patterns of behavior, which we can then apply to other things, right? And so this is, this is when you start to realize that everything we look at, we end up looking at through the, through the means of human consciousness and through ultimately what it means for, for humans. Um, and that's why even the, the person studying bugs, you'll realize that as they discuss bugs, when they do their lab work, maybe not so much, but when they talk about it, all of a sudden they'll take out all this anthropological language. They'll take up all of these analogical language. And someone who's looking at how ants work will inevitably compare it to the way we do things and compare and contrast how apes are to humans, compare and contrast of how these, these, these uh, systems in, in the, the, let's say in the natural world are related to our system. Yeah. Um, this is something that you almost, have, you kind of have to pull out a little bit to realize that it's how attention, how attention works. Um, but the other way, the other way in which it also works for science is that phenomena is indefinite, right? Phenomena is, is a quantum field you could use the scientific world. And so what scientists are always doing is trying to find patterns which gather phenomena together. And so they're trying to find a pattern which is able to explain more phenomena. Then, so you could, you, could, you could explain the idiosyncrasy of why a bug is going from, you know, from here to there, but you would, what you want is to find a pattern which explains why bugs go from here, this type of place, to this type of place, right? So when you're doing that, you're, you're participating in the same description of the world that I talked about. You're trying to unite reason, trying to unite higher patterns to, to potential manifestation. And then trying to gather these, these uh, manifestations into larger patterns so we can actually have the capacity to view the world in unity and say, oh, this is what explains why bees do this type of behavior. Not just this one little bee that is doing it, but all the bees, when they do this, they're participating in this pattern that I've been able to recognize. Yeah. And just like the chair, the pattern isn't in the bees. Right? The pattern isn't in the, the behavior. It moves up from the behavior and it appears, let's say, above it and then embodied in the behavior. So, and that's an incarnational way of seeing the world. As, you know, as much as, you know, as much as talking about the head and the body and the, the body of Christ, it's, a, it's an incarnational, it ends up inevitably being something like an incarnational vision. So before uh, man appeared on earth, all of this was sort of like in preparation for the coming, for the coming of man, for the coming of humans, so to speak. And well, yeah, that, but that's also why you could, there's a way in which there's a notion, which is, which was not taken up as much, let's say in Christianity, but it's kind of there implicitly. You know, when, you know the, I don't know if you've seen the images of, of uh, Christ creating the world. When we show God creating the world in the Orthodox tradition, we show Christ creating the world. The Pantocrat is the Pantocrator. Yeah. But he's a he's a man. 
Mm-hmm. He's a man God. Mm-hmm. And that's a super important notion. It wasn't explicit. It wasn't explicited as much in the theology, but in Jewish thinking, for example, in the Philo, you find this idea of Adam Kedmon, the notion of universal man, which was there at the outset of creation and participated in creation. So this be- takes its resolution in Christ, which is, it, it's hard for us to think because we're so linear in our thinking, but we could say that this is something which will scandalize some and not others, that the incarnate Christ created the world from the beginning. That, 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 that Christ created the world from the beginning and that part of that was eternally, eternally the pattern was that man was united, going to unite himself with God, but that becomes the, the very pattern of reality. And so man was there at the outset necessarily for the world to exist. But man, not man, just man, but the incarnate man, Christ, was there. But how do you explain this looking at the immensity of the universe? And uh, we know now that just in our own uh, galaxy, there are like billions of stars and everything is so, and there are perhaps billions of galaxies and everything seems to be infinitely large, like numbers we can't even imagine. (laughs) And here we are on this one little planet and... uh, could it be that there's then man on other somewhere else out there, or it's like I don't think like I don't think all? that's a useful I don't think that's a useful frame at all. I, I, first of all, it seems that no, at mm-hmm. least for now, you know, it seems that no, there isn't. Uh, it, it seems that at least for, for now, the Earth does indeed seem to be the center of the universe, not the center physically but a center in the sense that this is the place out of which we look at everything else, but mm-hmm. right? this is the center of meaning, you know, maybe not the, 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 the center in a, in a kind of a physical sense, whatever that even means. I don't think that even means anything anymore with, with, with this, with the idea of the, this kind of expanding universe where all points are the center and, you know, there's no center. So I don't think that even means anything, but in terms of meaning, it seems at least for now that this is the center of the cosmos. And everything else, how beautiful and how, how complex it is, is beautiful and complex because we see it. It's beauti- beautiful and complex because we are able to, to, to now look at it and see it through the God-given consciousness and capacity to view beauty that we have. Um, so that's, that's really how I see it. I, I, it doesn't, the idea that the, that the universe is, is indefinitely large and the billions and billions of, of stars doesn't bother me one single bit, you know, especially if we believe that there are also myriads of angels, myriads and myriads of angels. You know, the idea that every time I'm in communion with someone, there's an angel who's acting at the, as, the, as the, the, the head of that communion is something which is, can be as, as mind boggling as thinking of the quasars and all the black holes and all of this stuff that, that is out there. To me, that doesn't, doesn't affect me in the, in the least. Um, and I think that we should be very wary of, of the idea of that, of a intelligent life coming from outside. We should be, we should be very wary of that because as people explore that, especially now, you'll notice what they're exploring is rather something like the idea of monstrosity, something like the idea of Pliny's monsters on the edge of the world. So if you look at the way people represent extraterrestrials right now, they are very much related to the way in which people uh, represented the the monstrous races on the edge. Uh, And even the way that the the angels are described in the book of Enoch, you know, as being technical as well, these kind of of technical angels that that are coming from the outside to... uh, to save us, destroy us, teach us technology, all of these things. And so the way the imagination actually uh, deals with an idea of uh, extraterrestrial life uh, is, something to be, is something to be attentive and worry about because it participates in a more ancient pattern, uh, you know, of, of this idea of that which is on the borders of the world as being uh, hybrid and monstrous and, and mm-hmm. dangerous. Right, right. I see what you... I see what you mean. Yeah, because that sort of uh, leads me to my next question, because uh, we are taught that God is uh, God loves us and uh, we are going towards God. And and then in the New Testament, we learn that God is our father. He's Abba. He's like uh, Papa. God is is close to us. But when you look at 
the wor- when you look at the immensity of the universe that surrounds us, well, it's a pretty cold and dark place and rather frightening. Maybe like you say, like for the ancients too, maybe they felt the same way. But... Uh, I mean, it's... it's it, how can I say this? We have to recover this human scale. Like, th- this scale that people want us to live in, this, this, cos- this scale of like quasars and black holes is not, is not real. It's, mm-hmm. it's an abstraction. It's an abstraction from your existence. Your existence is not that. Nobody encounters black holes. Nobody encounters quasars. These things don't exist in your world. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying they don't exist in the, at all. They do exist, but they, mm-hmm. they, are, they should be blips. They should be things that are very far away from you and that you hear about and that you're fascinated by, but that they, they don't participate in, in your life. Your life is the same as the people that were there thousands of years ago. The sun rises in the morning, it goes down at night, the sky is above, the earth is below. Uh, you know, you get a sunburn if you go outside and you don't wear a hat. That's reality. Like that is the embodied reality we live in. And that's the embodied reality out of which meaning emerges. That other reality, right? The, the, this, kind of, this kind of massive thing. And even the idea of the solar system, all of these things are all abstractions. They're all things that you can never experience. You can never experience the solar system, right? You can experience the Saturn going through the sky. You can experience that. But the solar system is a complete abstraction. It is far less real than your everyday experience. And I say this technically, right? I'm not, this is not a polemical thing that I'm saying, is that we have, we've come to accept that these, these abstract scientific models that are presented to us that that is reality, but nobody will ever experience an atom. Nobody will ever experience molecules. These things are abstract models that are useful, but that they're not part of our experience. And so in order to kind of recapture the idea of God as your father, the God in heaven, you know, all of these images that are used by traditional religion, we need to re-enter our actual lived experience. And then see that as the, the, the place out of which meaning irradiates, let's say. So once you get that, then all of a sudden, the, the images of, of God, the images of the Father, the images of heaven, the image of the temple, all these images will make more sense because they're, they're actually grounded in your encounter with people and, and, and experience every day. Uh, and they're, they're not... We, the world is upside down right now. Mm-hmm. The most immediate experiences we have, we're told that those aren't real. Mm-hmm. And the most abstract scientific models that are presented to us, we're told that that's real. But th- how alienating is that? It is so alienating for people. Exactly. Maybe there's some kind of a nihilism behind all of this. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, because it's like devalues human life. And then humans then become... I don't know, they're like the same as the insects or or whatever. It devalues human life. People, human life begins to become something very insignificant because we're looking at at, uh, these uh, scientific models, like you're saying, and these mind-boggling models as well. Exactly. um, And but I think that it's, I think that a lot of people are realizing that right now, you know, as we watch the effect of modern thinking and the, let's say the effect of the, of the enlightenment project, as we kind of watch it reach its, its final fruits in, in the social fragmentation that is growing around us, as we watch the narratives break down, as we watch, you know, uh, also storytelling becomes, com- become polemical, you know, to in a way that you can't disentangle anymore. All of these things is helping reveal to people, you know, the problem that we're facing and that and that the this kind of cold scientific vision of reality it it doesn't work it's hiding other things it's hiding other values and it and those other values start to start to appear and to reign and then we we notice what what's going on and like you said you know the the kind of leveling the the kind of leveling that science does let's say the kind of break you know it's kind of trying to reduce the world to what is can be quantified what can be counted what can be analyzed uh 
and a refusal to notice hierarchies of meaning in, in the world has been very powerful and very useful, but it's also what gave us the suburbs ultimately. It's also, it's, it's ultimately what gave us this flat world in which you don't even know your second neighbor and you have no projects in common with anybody. And there is no center to the community. There's no place where we can gather together and dance, gather together and sing, gather together and celebrate that which binds us together because we're not bound together. We're just a bunch of points on a, on a grid, just like a, just like a nice scientific model. Uh, but that is killing us, right? It's killing us because we are not that. We are communal beings. We're beings meant to be in communion with each other. We're beings meant to celebrate, celebrate the things that are part of our story, celebrate the things that join us together, you know, and ultimately we're worshipful beings. We're, we celebrate, you know, the things that are above us. Um, and so, and so I think that, uh, a lot of people, you know, some people will go off the cliff and will end up on antidepressants and, you know, there'll be, the, the, there will be that, that line will go there. But I think many people will wake up and I think it's, it is kind of happening now. There are thousands of people uh, that I encounter that are atheists becoming Christians, like thousands that are, that are nihilists who have come to the end of their rope and they're realizing that this can't be, like, this doesn't work. And re-exploring these ancient stories and re-exploring the ancient patterns of meaning making has been a way for them to not only find meaning, but just reconnect, uh, you know, reconnect to, to, the, to the source, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, this, now, this, uh, what you've been describing, this sort of alienation, do you think it's basically that it's like we humans are sort of just lost in the woods by our own... Uh, wandering or by our own ignorance or do you think that there's some kind of a of um some kind of a calculated force behind all of this or something is pushing this or how how do, how do you understand that yeah it's a we have to see it as a playing out of the actual pattern of reality it's something which on the one hand you could say is inevitable Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't justify it, right? Christ said, you know, scandal must come, but woe mm -hmm. to those by whom it comes. So we have to understand it as a, 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 an increase of the fall, as moving down the mountain, moving away from the glory of God. That has a, that actually has a shape. It has a, it, it looks like something, you know, as you move away from the top of the mountain where heaven and earth meet, where quality is, is found, then we, we end up happening as we move down, we move into quantity, and then quantity becomes fragmentation, fragmentation becomes idiosyncrasy, and idiosyncrasy becomes little tyrannies at the same time. These little, these idiosyncrasies are also often little tyrannies trying to impose their little idiosyncrasy on others through power, through just raw physical, uh, you know, raw political and, and cynical power. Uh, and so you see that, for example, um, you see it in, in the, the, the relationship of Moses on the top of the mountain and the Israelites at the bottom of the mountain who worship the golden calf. You, know, you see it in Christ going up to the Mount of Olives to receive consolation and the disciples at the bottom of the mountain falling asleep. You see it in Christ going up the mountain in, in the Gospel of Matthew to pray to, to the Father and the disciples on the ship lost in the waves panicking. And you ultimately see it in the image of the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and then Noah on the flood after the giants destroy the world, basically. And so this is the pattern. And now we are in the dark version of the pattern. Mm -hmm. We are in the, in the bottom of the mountain with the idiosyncrasies, with the little tyrannies, with the chaos, with the confusion, with the carnival. Uh, this is where we are. And so on the one hand, it's, it means that we're watching this story break apart. We're watching the world basically fall apart, but there's also an opportunity there as well because, because it hurts, right? It's painful when things break apart. And so that pain is an opportunity for people to, to have a metanoia, to turn back, to see where they are, and then to go and notice that there's a mountain in front of them. First of all, they won't see the glory, of course, but they'll at least notice that there's a mountain and then start to slowly ascend the mountain and rediscover this world. Um, and so, so, like I said, I think that 
there is a force behind it. It's, it's almost an inevitable story. You could say something as simple as that. It's the evil one. It is. It's the devil. The prince of darkness. Yeah. It's the prince of darkness. Really, there he's the one who's making, who's kind of pushing the world in this direction. <clears throat> we are complicit. We are part of it, right? In the same way that we fall into our own passions individually, and we fall into our own chaos and the tyranny of our of our little idiosyncrasies. Uh, now we are seeing a social version of that, but but it, like I said, it can also be an opportunity for people to to in their suffering notice that this isn't this isn't working. So. <laughs> oh my goodness oh my goodness uh getting back to the universe i read i uh i read somewhere i don't know who said this whether it was a scientific person or a poet but i read uh, somewhere that the universe is apparently in the shape of a human being you know if you take the the universe which is 13.7 billion years old if you looked at it from the outside it's in the shape of a human body whether. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard that. You know, I, I would say whether it's true or not, uh, in terms of of physical phenomena, that's the thing about science is that you just get all people tell us science is you can trust and it's objective, but you have a million people saying a million different things about the same, the same, especially these cosmic things. But whether it's true or not, it definitely reflects an ancient mythological way of understanding the world, which is that the the universe is human has a human shape. And mm -hmm. you can you can experience that in a more immediate way. The way oh, you have that in ancient mythology that the universe has a, a human shape. I didn't know that. Wait, no, it it has a human shape because it's the macrocosm of us. Mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily physically have a human shape, but it has a human shape because because intelligence is that which makes you in the universe exist. And so there's a head and a body. There's a invisible part and a visible part. Right in the same way that St. Maximus talks about microcosm and macrocosm, see, I don't, I don't see the universe as just a dead, cold, physical thing. The universe mm -hmm. also includes the invisible part of it, and so I'd rather see it that way than just imagine the physical shape of the entire universe. Uh, I don't know, like it, all th those types of speculations. I think I, they're kind of funny uh, because. I don't even know what it would. What does it mean to be outside the universe and look at the shape of the universe? Like I, I don't know what that means. Yeah, like I, I don't know. That. Even scientifically, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Uh, but then, but then, like I said, it it, it reveals to us the, a desire, like a desire to reveal something about reality, which is which is in line with with uh, surprisingly in line with how the ancients, like someone like them, access to actually viewed you know the the cosmos. So. So, Jonathan, uh, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating discussion. I really appreciate uh, your taking the time to talk to us. I'm sure uh, anybody listening uh, found this, it, like I said, really fascinating. It's oh, it's my really pleasure. And, and I wish you the best with your, your podcast. And, uh, and uh, yeah, send me a link once it's, it's up so I can sure. share it as well. Thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure.